Good afternoon, everybody. You're on the call when sexual assault survivors call suicidality within the context of sexual assault. And welcome to this webinar. My name is Janice Mirabasi, and I'll be the moderator today. I'm also a program coordinator with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and I work with all of the rape crisis programs in the state of Massachusetts. We'll be co-sponsoring this webinar today with the folks from our suicide prevention program here at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, before I introduce our presenters, Lisa Hartwick and Elizabeth nash Wren, I'd like to review a few housekeeping issues. First, if you experience any technical difficulties with either the audio or the video for this webinar, please jot down this number. It's also written up on the uh, screen here in the chat section, but this phone number for any problems that you're having is 1-800-843-9166. Again, that's 1-800-843-9166, and a ReadyTalk representative will be more than happy to give you a hand. Secondly, all the phone lines have been muted except for the presenters and for the moderator, so please use the chat function located in the left corner to type in any questions that you may have. Given the number of participants, Lisa and Elizabeth will do their very best to answer as many questions as possible as we go along and at the end of the webinar during the question and answer period. So uh, before we start, I would like to ask, move to the next slide, we have a response question, you should be seeing it up on your screen, and I would like to, uh, we'd like to get an idea of who's joined us today. So I'm going to ask that you select the title that most generally represents the work that you do and in, the, in your field, and if you choose the option something else, if you would like to do so, you may also send us a little message through the chat function and tell us what it is that you do that's not represented. So please feel free to choose and uh, press the submit button and we'll wait a second to get the results. And if more folks join in, we'll see more results as we go along. I have a list of the participants as well. And um, as you can see, we have a lot of advocates who have joined us today. We have registered for this program, we have uh, many rape crisis centers, domestic violence programs and shelters, some community-based suicide prevention programs, schools, victim witness programs, family planning and Planned Parenthood programs, a sexual assault nurse examiner, someone from the Women's Commission, health centers, tribal nations, mental health services and therapists. But I would say looking over this list that the majority of folks who are joining us today are focused on survivor services for people who've experienced sexual assault and or intimate partner violence or sexual assault within the context of intimate partner violence. So just so you know, that's who's with us today. I'd like to introduce the first of our presenters, Elizabeth Nash Wren. Elizabeth worked as the Assistant Director for the North Shore Rape Crisis Center in Lynn, Massachusetts from 2008 to 2011. Prior to her work with the North Shore Rape Crisis Center, Elizabeth worked for the Department of Public Health's Bureau of Substance Abuse Services for seven years. She is on the Board of Directors for Lynn Economic Opportunity as well as for Salem State University School of Social Work Alumni Organization. Elizabeth received her MSW from Salem State University with a focus in end-of-life care. She's currently dedicating her life to raising her beautiful baby girl, Georgia Grace. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Janice, and welcome, everyone. Um, it does look like we have a diverse group here on the presentation um, participating today, which is great. I did want to start um, with just giving an overview of what I'm going to be covering today. I'm going to do a quick overview of sexual assault prevalence. I wanted to be mindful of the fact that not everybody on the phone call today works in the field of sexual assault services. And then I wanted to cover the prevalence of suicidal ideations and behaviors among survivors of sexual assault. 
Next, we want to work on uh, the understanding, understanding the relationship between trauma and suicide among survivors of sexual assault, a little bit about what makes survivors contemplate suicide. And lastly, I wanted to talk about finding a place for risk of suicide in strength-based work. You know, where and how does risk assessment fit into strength-based work, which is a lens used by many advocates in the field, as we know. Uh, strength-based work, of course, meaning that we focus our work on the strengths and resilience of those that we work with. Um, Janice gave you an overview of my background. I apologize. I get to slide there. This is very sensitive. Okay. So um, as Janice mentioned, I did used to work for the Department of Public Health um, for a number of years, and then I went back to get my MSW, at which point I had the opportunity to intern for the North Shore Rape Crisis Center. Um, upon completing my MSW, I did leave the Department of Public Health to become the Assistant Director of the North Shore Rape Crisis Center. And while receiving my MSW, I had the opportunity to participate in a DPH-funded initiative uh, that worked with social work programs to assess and increase the competency of new social workers in areas of working with suicidal um, clients. And our work was ultimately presented at the um, NASW 2008 Symposium. I bring this up because as a student, I was approached about participating in this project because I was deemed to be working in a high risk, um, with a high risk population. So some of the work I'm presenting today is from that. So like I said, I wanted to do an overview of the prevalence of sexual violence in um, America. So the first statistic is from 2010. It's from the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey. And it found that over 18% of women and 1.4% of men self-reported being a victim of rape in his or her lifetime. Um, statistics vary. Um, from study to study, especially I would say the uh, reporting from male survivorship, we, we often see numbers much higher than that. Um, the next two statistics come from uh, BARC's website, which is a Boston Area Rape Crisis Center. For those of you who are not familiar, um, they have a wonderful website with great information. I would definitely refer people to look at their website for information. Um, and they, this statistic says that around one in six women and one in 33 men experiences um, report experiencing an attempted or completed rape in their lifetime. And those statistics, I think, are more in line with what we typically see. Um, the next statistic is from Massachusetts. It's worded a little strange. Um, the findings are from 2006 that over 4,000 adolescents and adults were sexually assaulted in Massachusetts that year. And that comes out to be 12 people a day, um, one every two hours. And lastly, the uh, statistic is um, for college-age women, it's estimated to be 20 to 25 percent of college-age women experience um, an, an attempted or completed rape. So I just wanted to give an overview that we can see that obviously sexual assault is devastatingly prevalent um, in America. And that when I worked uh, at the, as an assistant director at a rape crisis center, people would often say to me, I don't know how you do that work. Um, I could never work with survivors of sexual assault. And my response was always, you do work with them. We all work with survivors. Um, it's very prevalent. The difference is that we talk about it um, at a rape crisis center. So the fact that we have such a diverse group of people registered today, I want to commend you for being from different fields and still being open to talking about sexual assault with the individuals you work with. Sorry, I'm just getting a little used to how sensitive the cursor is. Okay. Okay, so um, like I said, when I was approached to participate in the core competencies program um, at my MSW program, I was very open to joining in, but my initial thinking was, I do work with sexual assault survivors, but I'm not actually encountering a lot of suicidal individuals. Um, but I signed on 
regardless, I think my lens is very black and white, but these were survivors. This is the term used in sexual assault services. Um, it's very strength-based. Uh, the definition of survive is actually quite counter to the thought of suicide assessment. It means to remain alive or in existence, to live on, to continue to function or prosper. So we know that our clients are resilient. They've survived significant trauma, and they're asking for help. It's true. Survivors of sexual assault are incredibly strong individuals. But I think we often feel that the risk is behind them. You know, survivors, it, it suggests that the risk is past tense. So I think that um, part of this presentation is to challenge our thinking that, you know, someone may have survived sexual assault, but they're still at risk. I want to start out by acknowledging that there's large gaps in research. Um, around the area of suicidality among sexual assault survivors. A lot of the research was done in the 1990s and it was often done with female survivors. So I just want to put that out there in the beginning if you wonder why some of this data is a little on the older side, that is why. So I'm sure that some of you are familiar with the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I really encourage you to Google it, to look it up. It's a fascinating study. It was done with adults and asked them to report experiences in their childhood um, and attempted to make correlations between childhood experiences and uh, behaviors in adult life. And the study was done between 1995 and 1997. It was done with over 17,000 respondents um, in primary care clinics. And, um, it assessed for childhood abuse, household dysfunction, suicide attempts, and multiple other issues. The ACE study found that over 24% and 16% of men self-reported they experienced childhood sexual abuse. So obviously a very high number. One of the primary researchers on the ACE study found uh, was quoted saying childhood sexual and physical abuse have been strongly associated with suicide attempts. In fact, the risk of suicide was three times higher uh, for those who experienced childhood sexual abuse. So the study definitely found that there was a relationship. The next study that we looked at was a National Women's Study. Again, an older study, but very powerful findings. It was conducted in 1992, and it looked at survivors of rape. It found that survivors of rape were three, I apologize, for sure. Okay, I apologize. It found that survivors um, of rape were three times more likely to be experiencing um, a major depressive episode and 3.5 times more likely to currently be experiencing a major depressive episode. I think that's important so we're mindful of the state of mind that a sexual assault survivor may be in. Okay. Um, going further, participants in the National Women's Study were then asked if they ever thought seriously about committing suicide. And the findings were that one-third of rape victims compared to 8% of non-victims said yes. Survivors of sexual assault were 4.1 times more likely than non-crime survivors to have contemplated suicide. So we can see there is a real increased risk of contemplation. And then moving forward, the next bullet, they were 13 times more likely than non-crime victims to have attempted suicide. I mean, that's a pretty significant and staggering difference. The last slide that I looked, like, looked at also from the 90s um, had about 3,000 respondents just under, and it assessed lifetime suicide attempt rates among sexual assault survivors versus individuals with no known history of sexual abuse. And again, it found that sexual assault history was associated with increased prevalence of lifetime suicide attempts, even after controlling for sex, age, education, um, post-traumatic stress symptoms, and psychiatric disorder. I think the next bullet is really um, important as well. For women, the odds of attempting suicide was three to four times greater when the first reported sexual assault occurred prior to 16 years of age versus when the assault happened later in life, which is important to think back to the ACE study that I referred to and the fact that 24.7% of adult women surveyed said that they did survive childhood sexual abuse. And we know that many survivors um, experienced their first uh, experience of sexual assault in adolescence. Okay, so the ACE study and the women's study 
clearly established that surviving sexual abuse early in life can create long-term risks of suicidality. Um, but we look at studies like the Massachusetts Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, which has established that there's also a short-term risk. It, it's not just that childhood sexual abuse you know, put someone at risk later in life. The risk is immediate as well. There is short-term risk. So um, the YRBS in Massachusetts found that adolescents who self-reported uh, experiencing sexual contact against their will were five times more likely to contemplate suicide when compared to their peers who had not experienced um, unwanted sexual abuse. This slide was provided by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. It is from the 2003 YRBS. Um, and if you look at the slide, what it's comparing is adolescents who self-reported attempting suicide. The black bar is those who had, um, had experienced, to the left there, um, dating violence, and to the right, ever experienced sexual contact against their will, versus their peers who were not reporting these experiences who had attempted suicide. So we can see that there's a significant difference. It is a statistically significant difference. And while the most recent YRBS data has not been released yet, um, the Department of Public Health has shared that it does continue to show a very strong correlation, and there is still a, stati a statistically significant um, correlation. So we know that survivors of sexual assault contemplate suicide. So the next question is why? Uh, once we understand that the relationship is there, this slide is from Jane Doe. Uh, those in Massachusetts are very familiar with Jane Doe. It's a statewide coalition um, for sexual assault and domestic violence providers. And this is from the training um, handbook for volunteers, advocates, staff in the um, sexual assault provider world. Um, Suicide is seen by some as an escape from feelings of helplessness, torment, disbelief brought on by a sexual assault. Not that unlike um, other suicidal clients that you might encounter, a sense of help helplessness, um, but the sexual assault experience really seems to prompt this sense of help helplessness, torment, um, that leads the survivor to contemplate. A survivor may see suicide as the only option to end the shame, sadness, fear, guilt. I, I sat with countless survivors who said that they wanted to disappear. You know, that might be literal or it might be figurative, but they would rather disappear than face friends and family um, and their future with what they had survived. Um, the next bullet, survivor suicidal ideations are often temporary, but they should always be taken seriously. I think one of the most dangerous things in our field is cynicism. And I once had someone say to me, quote unquote, of course she's suicidal, she was raped. And while that makes us kind of gasp at the thought of that quote, I, I think that that sentiment can um, kind of linger in the field and be present, whether spoken or unspoken. So while we know the correlation is there, every disclosure, um, every risk could be taken very seriously. So in this presentation, I was thinking that it was important to share what are some of the challenges that are unique to a sexual assault survivor who is suicidal? Um, and you know, what is the experience of coping um, post-trauma? And I think we have to be present and able to sit with what it, must like be, what it must be like for a sexual assault survivor who's con contemplating suicide. So I want to include some information. When we think about that first bullet of isolation, a survivor might be isolated from support. You know, th this study is, like many studies, shows that um, the perpetrator is often someone the survivor knows, whether it be an intimate partner, a family member, or an acquaintance. So we think about sexual assault as such a violation of trust, not just body, not just mind, but trust. On top of that, the survivor may have lost their primary support system. That may be the perpetrator. So people that they would typically, you know, a survivor would typically turn to for support if he or she was contemplating suicide. They may now be isolated from those supports. Survivors may also be experiencing shame or self-blame. 
um, shame, guilt, and embarrassment, along with fear of retaliation, were found to be primary barriers in reporting sexual assault for college-age females. So I think that's important to think about because a survivor is in a position to be asking for help, not just in healing from the trauma, but if they're, you know, having thoughts, feelings of suicidal and suicidality, what might keep a survivor from asking for help? On top of all the normal things that would make uh, a client or an individual hesitant to ask for help when suicidal, a sexual assault survivor has this added layer of depth that they might be feeling shame or self-blame, and it might make them resistant to ask for help. So now that we know survivors um, may be contemplating suicide, what's, what's the next step? I wanted to um, provoke some thought around why advocates might either feel ill-equipped or resistant to explore the topic of suicide uh, when working with sexual assault survivors. And I, I'm a true believer that in order to make change on a personal level or a professional level, we have to be willing to really ask and confront why do we do things the way that we currently do? Why are our current practices in place? I think one reason is individuals don't want to undermine or offend a survivor. If the survivor didn't bring it up, I won't bring it up. Um, that might be the thinking. I don't want to plant the thought. I don't want to you know, bring up the conversation if they haven't mentioned it. And that might be one um, hesitation. I really believe that asking can feel counter to the health and profession if you feel unable to help. If you're a volunteer, an advocate, working on a macro level, no matter why you came to this work, you came to it because you wanted to help. If there's an area that an individual feels unable to help with, I think there can be a natural resistance to delve into that. So we can tend to stick with what we have the tools to help with, whether that be legal advocacy, whether that be um, medical advocacy. But I think the topic of suicide is something that individuals can feel um, somewhat unprepared to genuinely help with, so they may shy away from it. The next one is, unclear of agency policy protocol. Many people hear about a, a policy for an agency or a program during initial pre-service training, and then how often is it revisited? How prepared do they really feel? Um, I, think, I think that can bring up a lot of fear. Fear of liability, especially for professionals in the field. I mean, I think most professionals do have that fear. What if I bring up the topic? What if it comes up and I can't help someone? What if they ultimately commit suicide? I think these are some of the fears. Uh, the next one for me was always a big fear, uh, feeling unsupported by the system. Do I trust the police with this survivor that I feel protective of? Do I trust the emergency room? Do I trust that this person who is so fearful to trust individuals after trauma to send them to the emergency room where they may go inpatient and they may lose autonomy? So I think fear of the system can be, um, can be real and very present. And fearful to hear yes. If we ask, we have to have all the answers. Um, I think can be our personal feeling, and you know, I don't think that's a fair pressure put on ourselves. But I wanted to make this bulleted list and encourage those, especially in leadership and training, to bring these in to uh, supervision, to really revisit with your advocates um, and all those involved, anyone who might encounter suicidal survivors, and you know, re really delve in and confront, you know, where are people with this, and be willing to open a dialogue. I think it could be powerful. So I wanted to um, talk about truly finding a place for risk of suicide in strength-based work. Uh, so I'm encouraging you to reflect on, is risk assessment part of our or my daily practice? And I emphasize practice, because practice is something that we put into action. It means we do it more than once. Is it part of what I do? Is it part of my day-to-day my -day work? Not just a policy on file or in a training manual that was covered, you know, checkbox, everybody knows what to do. We have the confidentiality agreement. We tell them um, our policy, and then we move on. So really, is it part of my daily practice? Um, you know, or 
are we sometimes doing bare min minimum, going over the confidentiality agreement and saying we covered it, that's enough. So as far as how do I communicate with survivors about suicide? And Lisa's going to talk more about this, but one thing that really came to mind for me and is a confidentiality agreement. That's the time that you're most likely going to use the word suicide. And we kind of have this you know, key language that we say, the, the following circumstances um, are when I can't keep confidentiality. And if you disclose thoughts of suicide is one of those times. And I think it can be a little bit like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. If, if you tell me, that then I'll have to tell someone. And it can be very quietly almost making a deal with um, a survivor um, or a client of, in any field that, you know, well, if you tell me this, then you understand that I, I can no longer keep confidentiality. And I think that can feel a bit threatening to a client or, or a survivor. Um, it's a very clinical term that I use. I use the term hot potato. And it kind of means, you know, you throw it to me, I'm going to throw it right back to you. I'm going to give every indication I'm not going to hold this. Um, so be mindful of what message you're sending. And one way that I found very effective when I'm going over a confidentiality agreement is to go a little bit further than the language in the confidentiality agreement. Wording that I use is, I want you to know the scope and limitations of confidentiality in our work together. If you disclose to me that you're suicidal or having thoughts of suicide, I will likely have to break confidentiality. But that said, and this is, I think, really critical. This is a safe and the right place to share thoughts of suicide. I don't want you to hold the weight of that alone, and I won't hold it alone either. And that's the language that I use. And I really think that's less threatening, and it lets them know that you're in this together. So that I don't want you to hold it alone, and I won't hold it alone either. So you know, again, let the survivor know that you're going to engage supports. If they disclose, you'll engage supports to try and help keep them safe. Um, and I, I also say let them know that if you have a concern, that you're going to talk to them. Uh, they're not going to leave and you're going to make a phone call about a concern. Let them know that if I have a concern, I will let you know if I have a concern and we'll talk about it. Um, and I know that as I changed my language, and my comfort, which I think this quote addresses, um, survivors began to disclose to me at the beginning of my at the beginning of my uh, participation in the core competencies project. I remember saying, "No one's really disclosing to me. I'll, I'll participate. I'm working with sexual assault survivors, but no one's really disclosing to me." As my comfort increased, as I changed my language, as I made the small changes. By the end of my work as an intern um, at the North Shore Rape Crisis Center, I'd had a conversation about suicidality with every survivor I worked with. And I like this quote. It says, listening is a magnetic and strange thing, a creative force. When we are listened to, it creates us, makes us unfold and expand. I think that when it, someone feels heard, it allows them to go to that place that they might not other go to. Otherwise, go to. So I really encourage you to be willing to sit with it, be willing to hear it, and I think survivors really respond to that. We have to remember that survivors have countless places in their lives where they can't talk about what they're thinking and feeling. And we have to really fight any urge to create another place like that, even if it's a scary topic. Okay. So I wanted to do a quick overview of the risks and signs of suicide. Um, verbal indications might include people or the world would be better off without me. Maybe I won't be around anymore. Expressions of hopelessness or helplessness, giving prized possessions away. Previous suicide attempts we know is a, is a major indicator. A completed suicide with someone close to them, especially true for adolescents if a, if a key adult in their life um, modeled the behavior, daring or risk-taking behavior, personality changes, depression, lack of interest in the future, increase in drug and alcohol use. Now some of these we're going to see with survivors just by the nature of having survived trauma. 
But still, we have the responsibility to explore, to see if the risk, if you see these things, don't assume, oh, of course they're experiencing depression. Oh, of course they, whatever it is. Assume that it's worth checking in about. Assume that it's worth asking the questions. And lastly, I wanted to remind us that there can be very subtle cues. I was um, co-facilitating a survivor group, and one night it was cold, really not nice New England winter night, and we were doing a check-in, and I asked, and I asked, if you could be anywhere but here, in this cold, dreary uh, New England night, where would you be? And the first, you know, survivor said Hawaii, and the next survivor said Florida. And then the next survivor said heaven. And I thought that was really powerful. So we went around the group. I did, we um, checked in. She didn't really want to go further. You know, I asked, could you tell more, any, any more about that? No, she wasn't really interested. After the group, I checked in with her. I asked if I could speak to her for a minute. And I said, I just wanted to check in with you about your check-in response about heaven. And see, you know, are you having thoughts about going to heaven? Now, are you thinking about ending your life? And she assured me absolutely not. She told me that she was anchored in her faith and her life with her children and her grandchildren. She thanked me for checking in with her. And what I learned in that moment is even a response of no is a learning opportunity. Because how I responded to her is it is great to hear that. Just so you know, if you ever did have those thoughts and feelings, this is a place that it's safe to bring it. This is the right place to bring that. I'll hold that with you. So, you know, the fear that maybe you'll hear no and they might be offended, it's still an op a, a, a wonderful opportunity to have a conversation. So Lisa's going to talk a little bit more about some of this, but I just wanted to really emphasize what can we do. Our comfort is critical. Again, be mindful of the set subtle messages of the resistance you might have. Survivors are in incredibly intuitive. They pick up on our comfort. They pick up on what we're willing to hold. It's part of the daily assessment after, after surviving. I think that what I, what I call uh, cost-benefit analysis constantly. You know, uh, survivors are figuring out who can they talk to, who can they share with, who can they trust. So make sure that you are aligning yourself as someone that a survivor can talk to about things such as suicidality. Okay? Give yourself permission to talk about it. Talking about it will not plant the idea. Free yourself from that burden. And expect the topic to arise. You know, be, a, be mindful that it might create anxiety, but expect it to, to arise. We know there's a strong correlation. We know that these individuals have experienced trauma. We know that they might not have others to talk to, and they are coming to talk to you. Okay? The last slide I wanted to share is an activity that I've done with survivors, and I'm happy to email this out. There's many tree of life activities out there. Um, this one I created um, to do with my work with survivors. And the roots of the tree, which I usually make longer with a pen because our history is a little bit longer than what these roots show, um, that represents our past, and survivors can um, draw things, write words, glue things from magazines on to represent their past. The trunk is the right now, and the branches are the future. And I want to share this because I think it's important to remember that so much of the work that we do with sexual assault survivors tends to be focused on the past, what happened to them, right? And then also the right now, which is the trunk. So I'd like to point out to them that the right now, the trunk, is actually relatively small in the grand scheme of life. And that the future is quite expansive. So we know that individuals who are suicidal have lost perspective. So part of our work is to help an individual have a future perspective. And we have to, we have to be part of that process for them, talking about long-term future, talking about what an individual wants, helping them visualize what that might look like. Um, and I think that this activity can be really helpful um, in working with a survivor to, to think long term, to have them kind of map out what they want themselves for a future, to remember that they do have a future beyond what happened, but beyond the assault experience. So that wraps, wraps up my presentation. Um, thank you so much. Um, I hope this is helpful. I'm happy to take questions. Um,
we'll have time for questions at the end of the presentation as well. And again, I'm, I'm happy to share any, any information here. I'm happy to email out this activity in a Word document form. And I apologize for the technical errors. And uh, now I will hand things over to Lisa. <coughs> Thanks, Elizabeth, for sharing uh, your information. And uh, again, I want to encourage people to offer up questions or comments into the, check, the chat box, and we'll make sure that the presenters have all those. They can see the questions that you're typing in as well. Um, I want to introduce our second speaker for the day, Lisa Hartwick, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers and comments and sharing at the end. Lisa has worked as the Director for the Center for Violence Prevention and Recovery at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston since 2004. Previously, she was the Clinical Director for the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center, which is located in both Cambridge and in Boston, Massachusetts. She spent nearly a decade running the clinical programs at Boston Area Rape Crisis Center, which serves survivors of sexual assault, their families, and significant others. Ms. Hartwick spent the earlier part of her career as the clinical director of several outpatient medical men mental health programs. She is interested in multidisciplinary approaches to addressing sexual assault and domestic violence, as well as the intersection of trauma and mental health. Um, Lisa, it's all yours. Thank you so much. And, um I, I realize I probably wrote that for some grant, so that should be shorter. <laughs> but thank you for the nice introduction. Um, and uh, you know, one of the slides I didn't um, put in, but I wanted to just um, highlight uh, or a concept um, because it just dovetails so nicely with what Elizabeth said. Was Judy Herman's uh, very famous quote that says, "Trauma is uh, the result of trauma is disconnection." And really, recovery from trauma is making connections. So her tree exercise, I just thought that was a, um, just a lovely way of really giving people hope and connection uh, that they might not be feeling in that moment. So it uh, wasn't part of what I was going to talk about, but it was uh, just such a great fit in some ways. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about respectful conversations and interventions and um, a little bit about engaging systems and kind of when you need more than yourself and your organization, what else is out there. So um, that will be at the tail end of what I have to say. The most important thing I think you have uh, to offer uh, a survivor is really entering into a conversation who, uh, with someone who is suicidal with your humanity. Um, it, I think this is the most connective tool that you have to assist the person that you want to assist. And also, they're really not going to care what you have to say uh, in, in many ways if you, don't, if you don't make that connection. So I think that's imperative. And I think Elizabeth said that in many different ways. Um, you'll hear some of the ideas, concepts, and thoughts um, that I'm going to present. Um, and what I want to do is just say, you know, try them on. See what fits for you. And also, all of you work within the context of an organization. So what uh, policies, procedures, what is there in your organizations that may come to bear um, regarding when you're dealing with someone who is suicidal? Um, and uh, you know, there may be a lot of different things you can and cannot do depending upon your setting. So I want to start with this uh, Life of Pi quote. When you've suffered a great deal in life, each additional pain is both unbearable and trifling. And I picked this up um, uh, because I think that you know, many of my clients will say, what they are experiencing now is nothing compared to what they have experienced in the past. And they're letting me know that they've endured quite a bit in their lifetime. And at the same time, these very same folks are the ones that are extremely sensitive to any changes in my schedule, the environment, other factors that may come into our therapeutic work together. So in, in this case, I'm thinking of people who have experienced multiple traumas or what we're now calling complex trauma. And from the literature, we know that these folks are the people who will be more often calling with suicidal intent. Uh, they may have experienced childhood abuse or neglect, and a sexual assault may have happened during their adolescence or early adulthood, again, thinking that that's uh, when uh, the well, we know that that happens more often uh, to younger people. Um, although as we do more research, we realize it happens across the lifespan as well. Um, so we just want to keep in mind that uh, basically uh, for folks who are exper have experienced multiple traumas, that they may be calling us with some more frequency than other folks. So uh, again, I want you to um, be mindful of that because one of the things we want to do is to provide 
our staffs with training on complex trauma, as well as just have more literature available. Uh, so again, this is thinking beyond somebody who maybe, uh, although they've had one incident of sexual assault, that's a terrible thing in and of itself. But a lot of times, the folks that we're talking with who are suicidal have had multiple traumas. So here, uh, again, this doesn't completely flow naturally into this talk, but I just want to uh, give this resource, Trauma-Informed Care, and they have great slides at this website, so I encourage you to get to it. But basically, the idea that a lot of organizations now are looking to trauma-informed care as a standard of practice, and really it's a paradigm shift from, you know, what's wrong with you? You know, when you go to a doctor, you go to a therapist, the first question may be, well, what's, what's happening? What's wrong? Um, and one of the things we want to do is kind of switch that to what's wrong with you to one that asks what has happened to you. So just to keep that overlay um, in mind. And this is, I, you know, just to say, and uh, Elizabeth has so, so well brought out some of the stats, um, just that the history of sexual assault is associated with both suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. So. Uh, that's the reason for our talk here today. Um, and I think the other thing is, um, again, thinking about when, when did people experience um, a sexual assault that will have an impact on how it's, excuse me, how it's impacted them. So if they're very young or there's multiple traumas, um, obviously that will have a higher impact or most, most of the time it will have a higher impact on them. So what I want to do right now, switching gears a little bit, is just to show a very short um, clip. And while I do that, uh, it's just about three minutes long, really the idea is um, the partnering with a helping professional as well as I think we learn a lot from people who have attempted suicide. And so this is one of those opportunities to really hear from somebody who, um, who has experienced a suicide attempt. So here it is. This is Janice Marabasi, the moderator. I just want to um, let folks know you'll need to use your computer speakers to hear the sound from the video. And um, both the speakers and uh, the presenters and I will be lowering our, um, we'll be lowering our volume on our phone so that uh, you won't hear our feedback from that during this time period. So um, we won't be commenting, obviously, during the video, but I just wanted to give you that instruction. So please use your computer speakers so you need to turn up the volume on your computer if you've turned it down. Thanks. There's a lot of things that happen in your life that you can't choose. But the one thing that can never be taken away from you is your ability to choose how to respond. My name is Terry Wise, and I travel around the country. I do a lot of public speaking on mental health topics. I'll tell you about it in a few minutes. So there was a lot of things brewing at the time. On Christmas morning of the year 2000, I swallowed 200 Percocets and 60 doses of morphine with a pint of gin. felt like life was an endurance test for me. And making it to the next day, and to the next day, and to the next day, was truly, it was, um, it was just a fight for survival. I was home from the hospital, and nobody knew what I had just gone through. So I was alone before the attempt, and now I was really alone. Well, I had been seeing Dr. Glazer. I went to her office with the hope that maybe there was some way she could help me tolerate being alive. I think the key thing was not something specific I said, but I truly believed that together we could do the work and she could get better. When you get to that point, you feel so worthless. And, excuse me, to have someone believe in you that much. Suicide doesn't stand alone. It doesn't just happen as the result of nothing out of nowhere. It's the result of something. 
if you've gone through your life and you've had traumas or you've had difficulties or you've had things that you think you've buried and then you have a significant loss or a significant trauma occur later in your life as I did with my husband dying all of the things that have been on simmer in your life come to a full boil Suicide for me had become almost like a coping mechanism and I, I learned in therapy that death wasn't the only way to end my pain. There were other ways to end my pain besides death and one of them was developing coping skills and, and learning how to manage my feelings in a different way, which, which I did. There's, there's one thing that you, and everybody can do and that is that they can always reach out for help. There's always somebody there that will offer support. Everybody's in a position to reach out for help and get support and not be alone with how they're feeling. So I thought that that was a good um, kind of overview of how connecting with um, really this person, Terry Wise, connecting with herself, um, helping professionals. And I love the imagery of her actually paddling um, around and, and sort of just engaged in life in a very uh, meaningful way. So, um, and somebody asked if that uh, video is um, available. And um, it is included. You can look at the chat, I guess. You can download it from um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So what I'd like to do is um, not really, um, I think, go over exactly what Elizabeth had talked about, but just to to acknowledge that part of stepping into the conversation is uh, sometimes uh, with a lot of trepidation. And other times, um, I w I'm going to say for myself in working in a mental health uh, capacity over many years, not all of the mental health field is trauma-informed. So there is uh, maybe advocates or people who are reluctant to step into it, and then there's other, I would say, providers who tromp into it in a way that is maybe not um, as helpful either. So we want to have a sensitivity that um, really acknowledges some of the needs that survivors have and also to be mindful that uh, we want to uh, have a framework in which we're looking at the act or the need or the process of uh, thought process that's going through someone's mind uh, in being suicidal that really it's about a sense of control about you know, what they need in their life. Um, and so we want to be mindful of those. And sometimes the mental health professionals are not. But this is a good article um, that I thought, you know, if you are working with people, uh, therapists, uh, you're not one yourself, but you're working with folks, it's a great article to kind of give back to them. Um, and one of the things that it talked about was um, that really there were, again, this idea of leading with empathy and your humanity. Uh, but also that, you know, we really don't know all the reasons why someone is uh, thinking about harming themselves or hurting themselves. And the best way to know to some degree is to really ask these questions and to be very clear that we want to know the answer, um, that what this person has to say is uh, incredibly important and we're not going to be able to know without um, having this inquiry, this very open inquiry. Um, the other part of our role, if we're having this conversation with someone who is suicidal, is to really kind of gather some information. And for those of you who are mental health folks, it would be, you know, we're gathering clinical information and looking for any risks of suicide. Um, if your role is not as a mental health provider, you know, I saw that there are some attorneys on the line, there's some sane nurses, um, your role might be slightly different. But again, I think the idea that you are picking up on um, is this person really at risk for hurting themselves uh, is really important. So I'm just going to um, 
talk a little bit about, uh, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, so hopefully I won't have to say a thousand words uh, for this picture. But, uh, and I could have added a few other um, pictures to really describe really all sorts of addictions. And one of the vulnerabilities that uh, is associated with trauma, and particularly people with uh, multiple traumas, is um, addictions. That it, it makes perfect sense, because from the standpoint of having overwhelming feelings, um, and what we call that in, the, in a clinical setting is uh, dysregulation. So somebody feels bad, uh, feels very agitated, feels, um, you know, or feels depressed. Uh, so any number of feelings that can be quite overwhelming. Um, some, of, some, some forms of addictions really uh, address that in a way that many other things don't. So in some ways it's a very resourceful thing that people grab and gravitate towards um, whether it's an eating disorder or alcohol. I could have had a, a picture of some pills up here or cigarettes. So again, um, sort of looking for something that doesn't involve other people um, to help them soothe themselves. Um, and of course what ha you know, often ends up happening is that uh, the more that they use whatever it is that they're using, so if it's alcohol, um, it has a, a less, less of effect and more of a tolerance and therefore uh, it's a it's a bad cycle to start getting into, but in the beginning, it's actually quite a resourceful thing for people to um, to look towards. Um, in terms of um, oh, uh, just one more thing about that is you know one of the things that happens as as somebody is deeper and deeper into an addiction is that it destabilizes them, and so therefore it bec they become more vulnerable uh, for increased suicidal thoughts or actions. So helping people with addictions is often key to helping them with their trauma. And there's several, you know, there's any number of um, resources out there. I was just thinking that uh, Lisa Nachevitz, who's actually a local person, has a whole curriculum uh, called Seeking Safety. Um, Janina Fisher, who I'm, I'm quoting a few times here today, her website has a, a, a very good paper that you can download on addictions and trauma. So I think more and more we're, no, we're realizing that these things go hand in hand and we really need to um, take care of that. If we're treating people who are um, sexually assaulted or in other violent situations that they've been traumatized, then we need to look at the addictions as well. So we have to, you know, think about being non-judgmental of the behaviors, and I think as advocates, we're probably on on that, leaning on that uh, in a in a good way. Um, but you may not get the same response. And again, I'm going to point to some of the general mental health field where, um, you know, I've definitely heard at various points in my career, you know, the person is, you know, looking for attention, they're being manipulative. Um, sort of the negativity that can go along with some of the behaviors that you will see, um, whether it's self-harming or um, behaviors around uh, hurting themselves uh, as a suicide attempt. So we want to combat that, obviously, with being non-judgmental, but also having a lens um, that the self-harming behavior or suicidal thoughts are an attempt to relieve pain, not cause more pain. And um, I'm just going to read something here from uh, Gina Fisher. So she writes, um, and this is actually from her paper, um, Self-Harm and Suicidality, the most common mistake made by therapists is the assumption that self-harm and suicidality cause pain rather than relieve it. If we assume that self-harm induces pain, then we interpret it as masochism or self-punishment or a cry for help. And if we do that, we will miss the core issue of self-harm of mastery and, and relief seeking. Because they are unable to trust or effectively use other people for support, and here she's assuming people who can't use other people in support, so people who are uh, more likely um, often suicidal, survivors of trauma may seek relief in a variety of behaviors that share the common char characteristic of not requiring reliance on anyone but themselves. So use of drugs and alcohol to numb. Some use self-starvation or binging and purging to achieve a similar state, state of calm or non-feeling. Still others engage in a variety of self-injurious behaviors, such as cutting, scratching, burning, etc. Um, relief may also be sought through high-risk behaviors, so speeding, walking in dangerous areas, walking in front of cars, which induce an adrenaline response, and therefore a state of calm. Um, fantasies of suicide or thinking about suicidal methods can also induce the same psychobiological effects and therefore become paradoxically a way of coping and calming. So, 
you know, sometimes, you know, the, the lens that we look at is incredibly important. So if we want to um, understand somebody's behavior, again, we're asking them. But I like this lens of really, uh, and certainly is borne out in my work with um, individual patients and clients. I work in hospitals, sorry for the patient uh, slip there, but uh, work with clients who um, talk about um, how sometimes when they think about um, hurting themselves or when they think about suicide, it actually, um, it really is the ultimate form of control that if they want to, um, they don't have to be here. Um, and in that sense, it really allows them sometimes to feel like I can make it another day because if I can't, if it gets worse, I can actually um, do something about it. So kind of that, you know, um, the, the last card that they are holding. So we don't want to take that away from them because, again, we don't want to take any control away from a survivor. We want to actually say that's always an option, but let's talk about some other things. So that kind of segues us into um, moving further into the conversation. So some of the questions we'll ask, again, I just put these out here as examples, but are you thinking of hurting yourself? Um, you know, if, if they say yes, we want to ask, well, how are you thinking about this? And, um, you know, one of the things that we look at is, is it a plan to hurt themselves? Um, is, it, is it a behavior that is self-harming? So in terms of uh, is it a cutting behavior that has been done um, many times before so the person is stressed and so now they're trying to get some relief by um, cutting themselves? So we will do this whole conversation to find out exactly what's going on um, with them. Um, and we also want to give them options. You know, are there other ways to feel better? And again, this is uh, really the main, main uh, event. We want to really provide them with other options um, that they might not have thought about. So although this seems very straightforward, um, if somebody is, uh, you know, is think is says, um, you know, I am distressed, but I'm not going to hurt myself. You still want to go a few um, measures into that song. You still want to talk with them a little bit further, um, and partly you want to do that because um, some people are very compliant, um, or they'll say yes, yes, yes. That no, I was never going to hurt myself. No, you're, you know, absolutely not. Um, but when you press them a little bit more, and again, just kind of pursuing the conversation, they might say, well, yeah, I really am. And so you just want to make sure you're not pulling out of the conversation before it's actually done. Um, and that's an important thing to um, continue to do a little bit further than you think uh, might be uh, comfortable for you. Um, Depending upon your role, the policies, and the procedures of your organization, um, there may be particular aspects of this conversation that are um, more prescriptive. Um, and I have a, you know, a good example in, our, in the setting that I work in currently. If somebody is suicidal and after I talk with them and decide you know, they're really not so safe to leave and go home um, and they agree to go to our emergency department, um, I actually have to call an ambulance because I work on the east campus of our um, organization, our hospital, and the ED is on the west campus. And that's just, you know, I, kn I don't like that system, but that's the system that I am in. Um, and other people may have other um, sort of parameters that you have to deal with. And it's kind of good to know what those are so that, you know, when I've ever had to hospitalize somebody, I basically say, yeah, it's you know, not a great, I, it, I wish it were different, but this is how it is. And frankly, you know, they may be embarrassed. There may be a lot of things that are going on for them. And I can reassure them that it happens uh, multiple times a week and that really um, people going from east to west is not something that we get very excited about here. And in fact, um, they can see when people uh, come, it's, it's quite a matter of fact operation. Um, so again, knowing what your, um, institution does around uh, when somebody is suicidal is important because I think you can just add some comfort by, you know, talking with the person in a way that will make sense to them. So when we look at um, risk, 
I wanted to just talk about three different types, and again, um, we could look at it a little bit differently, but if you um, look at the material from um, suicide prevention, um, you know, usually there's people who feel badly, um, kind of this passive intent. They, you know, wish they weren't living, um, they don't feel well, uh, but they're really not doing anything about it right now. They're not even thinking about it a lot. And I have a great example, a woman that I see have seen for quite a while, um, puts it this way, you know, if I died, uh, you know, today it would be okay. I'm really done. Um, and, you know, she'll say that and then we'll go on and talk about lots of other things. Um, and at various points I certainly do check in with her to make sure that she's not going, uh, she isn't planning anything. Uh, but 99.9% .9 of the time it's this passive intent. Um, other people have more active thoughts of suicide and it actually, you know, if there's a crisis that, that may become all that they can think about. Um, and usually if somebody is at that point, then they are moving into the next um, phase, which is to actually make a plan for it. And so this passive active thoughts of suicide and active plans of suicide sometimes coincide, uh, you know, um, there's, there's a quick, uh, kind of passive to active to some plan, uh, and other times it's really, you know, the client that I just mentioned, passive intent most of the time. And this is a person I've seen for quite a while. Um, interestingly enough, she came into my office this week and, and she always gives me sort of gifts, usually just little trinkets. Uh, but this gift that she gave me was really, a, unfortunately, an example. Um, she had had a crisis uh, at her work and uh, basically she started to talk to me uh, about what she had done in the last two weeks. And one of the things that she was doing in the last two weeks was um, this is a person who never is actively suicidal, often depressed, um, is a person who has multiple traumas, childhood history, um, and a sexual assault in her lifetime. And she said, you know, I was so overwhelmed, I took out a huge bottle of pills and I just looked at them, and I didn't call anybody. I didn't even call you. Um, and then I ended up not doing it because I, was, I decided I, I just really was just too angry to even uh, think about um, killing myself. Um, and so, you know, here's a person who I would say, I, I, not confidently, but I thought, hmm, you know, I was really quite surprised that she moved into a very active phase uh, because I've seen her for a very long time, and usually uh, she really is much more passive. So uh, I use that example just to say people change. So when uh, we have these conversations, just because you've had the conversation once, uh, definitely doesn't mean you're done. In fact, uh, you know what we want to do is have it be part of our practice so that even if it's somebody we know very well, like the client that I just mentioned, um, you know, uh, note to my, note to self, I will be you know, checking in with her more regularly than I had and um, around this uh, because obviously it, it's something that can change quite quickly. So the other thing that we look at is, you know, is this a um, kind of a low lethality or a higher lethality method? So if somebody says that they are going to hurt themselves and they have a plan, uh, the next really part of that conversation is what is their plan something that they um, can have access to? Is it something that will, if they complete it, um, hurt them, kill them, um, et cetera? And um, I've had lots of different uh, interesting ex uh, examples of this. Uh, so I remember um, one woman that I saw many years ago who really seemed quite agitated, and I, I thought, you know, definitely she probably needs to go to a hospital because I couldn't imagine that I would be able to calm her down in the time that we had to work together. And one of the things uh, when I went to ask this question around how would she be, you know, she's thinking about hurting herself and what other things could she think about? No, no, can't think about anything uh, else. Um, she basically um, said that she would take out a knife and she would um, cut herself. And so I asked the next question, which is, you know, did she have an idea of what that knife would be? And she had her purse with her, and she opened up her purse, and she took out um, 
the dullest knife I've ever seen, which was kind of this plastic knife with no, not even a little serrated edge. So her lethality was low, uh, but her intention was high. So um, I think she still ended up going to a hospital because I, I figured the next thing she could get her hands on, she might actually try to hurt herself again, you know, not again, but also. Uh, but it was interesting um, because the, the, the tool that she was going to use to hurt herself or the means um, was quite um, ineffective, uh, but I was glad about that. Um, and then you have people where there's, you know, high lethality and, you know, we can think about, um, you know, firearms, which are very quick and um, deadly, um, or we can think about things that, you know, high volumes of uh, medicine um, or other, you know, ingesting things that are poisonous. Um, and again, we want to make sure we're aware of um, what the lethality is. And again, kind of an interesting example, uh, when I was working at the Rape Crisis Center, a woman um, had called the hotline the night before, had been quite um, suicidal, and so I you know, came in in the morning and got this note uh, basically that said, you know, can you follow up with this person? Uh, they were really upset last night, uh, but they, you know, they did end up swallowing some things, but they're okay, and this was the message that I got. And so I called the person and I said, hmm, um, so what did you take? And I, you know, she was very easily engaged, wanted to talk to me, really decided this was not a good plan. She really didn't want to die. She didn't even want to hurt herself. So she readily told me what she had ingested. Um, and she really did not want to go to a hospital. So I said, okay, what we can do is let me call poison control, which is what I did. And basically poison control said definitely she is, um, it definitely uh, is something that, um, you know, could kill her, and so get her to a hospital immediately. Um, and so it was interesting because the person themselves was saying, I'm really okay. I, you know, I took it six hours ago. I'm really okay. And I was able to say, poison control said these things have, you know, an effect, and I, I don't remember what the uh, actual pills were that she took, but um, she, she did go to uh, poison, uh, excuse me, to the emergency department after I talked to poison control. So. Again, the high lethality um, was a little bit hidden in that example, but I think you get the idea that she, you know, had ingested something and was pretty serious and then really regretted it pretty quickly and called um, the hotline. So the other thing, um, and I've already mentioned, um, you know, one of the most, most lethal forms um, of killing oneself is firearms. And, you know, this is just a slide that I had uh, picked up uh, for a training I went to recently. And one of the things that we can definitely do is ask about firearms. So um, instead of waiting for someone, you know, if you are doing an assessment and somebody says that they're thinking about hurting themselves, um, you know, one of those questions should be, you know, is there a firearm in the house or do you have access to a firearm? And uh, again, we want to make sure that if that's the case, that we get some help um, to get the firearm out of the home. Um, I was seeing somebody uh, recently, and actually she, it wasn't so much that she was suicidal, but uh, her partner uh, wasn't really doing well and actually had said, you know, if you leave me, uh, I, don't, I do a lot of domestic violence work, um, so if you leave me, I will have nothing, I will kill myself. Um, so I did the assessment as I would with anybody, you know, tell me what you're worried about. Um, and she, she didn't think about a firearm. She just said, I think he would kill himself. I'm just, you know, I'm also worried that he would hurt me. Um, when I asked, was there a gun in the home? And she said, uh, and again, gun in the home is one thing and access to guns is the other question. Um, she said that, uh, in fact, there was a gun. And when I asked her, you know, could we, think about getting rid of the gun. She actually had some sentimental attachment to it because it had been her father's and it was, you know, an antique and, you know, all these other things. And so we ended up working it out that she could buy a gun, uh, basically a, a lock for the gun that went somewhere other than in her home. So these are the kinds of things you need to kind of drill down on when you meet with somebody um, or have somebody else do that so that you're really getting the full breadth of what might be involved uh, in their particular situation, and usually they're very particular situations, right? Um, everybody has um, lots of different um, 
idiosyncratic things about their house and how, how everything works in their life. So again, this conversation is important. So what I want to do is, and I feel like I'm realizing I skipped a, one slide, but I'll go back to it if it's important. Um, the need for increased structure. So say you, um, you, know, you have this conversation, you realize the person is not um, safe, and you really need some other um, help. Um, and one of the things that you know, as mental health providers we, we sometimes think about is, um, is something called a contract for no, no, no suicide. Uh, and I also just included this, um, basically, the case against no suicide contracts. Um, so I, I don't want to be uh, talking, opposing myself in this conversation, but basically, for years and years, uh, we used to, you know, contract for safety. So most of you, if you've been in uh, this field or rape crisis counselors, you've heard that term. Um, this particular article, which if you, uh, we could certainly include it if that's what Janice can do, um, really talked about the idea of contract being a bit of a problem in terms of the word itself. Um, the idea, I think, is really to say, uh, we want you, you know, this person that you're talking to, we want you to be around so that you can engage in life. You're a wonderful person. You're trying to pull for all of their strengths. Um, and the, the word contract seems to have some problematic um, sort of prescriptive and taking the control out of uh, the hands of the survivor. And also, it's basically maybe shutting down the conversation. So if you, for example, say to somebody, you know, can you, you know, contract with me that you will be safe until, you know, you see a therapist in the morning. That would be something typical that we might do uh, when I was at the Rape Crisis Center and the person could say yes or no, depending upon how the conversation went. Uh, but what this article is saying is the contract word itself is problematic. So what we want to do is really ask the person, you know, can you commit to just staying alive, you know, through the night, um, so that, you know, in the morning if things look better, you haven't taken that option away from yourself um, of living, um, something like that. So, um, so just, you know, be mindful that that's kind of the, the way things are moving, I think, in um, the suicide prevention world. And I thought it was a really well-written article and I think made a great point to the fact that the, um, the way we had been doing it for years and years, at least the word contract was problematic and there were some better ways to do it. So, um, so that's a good thing. Um, the other thing that we can, uh, you know, um, use, so say you try to talk with the person about not hurting themselves and what structures do they have in their own life um, that will help them um, make it through. Uh, but you don't really have a real clear sense that that's what they're going to do. Um, or they say, no, I'm really you know, going to hurt myself and really nobody can do anything about it. So you may end up, and again, in my experience, this is the very small percentage of cases. Usually people are calling you or coming in for service because they really have this um, sense that they want to live. Uh, but if they really don't and you feel like you need to intervene, then in Massachusetts anyway, we have something called uh, Section 12, which is really sending someone to the hospital against their will. Um, and again, as advocates, um, even if you have to do that, I think the thing to do is to really do it trying to stay in connection with that person. You know, I can hear that you can't keep yourself um, alive uh, during, you know, whatever bargaining that you had done with them. Um, and this is what I feel like would be the most helpful. Um, you know, sometimes I say to people, I'm really sorry that it's come down to this. I wish we could kind of come to some agreement, but, you know, I have to intervene. And, um, you know, and sometimes you're just doing it, you know, without having that conversation because uh, of the slide prior, you know, it may be a lethal means. You maybe don't have time to kind of have this long conversation with somebody. So you may just have to um, act. Just so that you know, in Massachusetts now, licensed independent clinical social workers are authorized um, to transport to an emergency room for evaluation. And that could be important if, for example, you're a part of a rape crisis center 
and um, you know you want to um, get somebody to the hospital, and um, you're feeling like the only way to do that is through um, through is through go, calling the police or calling an ambulance. If you do have a social social worker who is a supervisor, and you've kind of worked this. Uh, out ahead of time, it might be a more a less traumatic way of doing it. You know, I know, um, you know, if it were uh, in this hospital, I could say, you know, my supervisor, you know, I would say my supervisor can do this. I know her; she's a great person. Let's when you get to the hospital, um, you know, uh, sometimes advocates could come in with somebody and sit with them in the waiting room or through the triage process. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about just e briefly, and I realize I'm kind of running out of some time here, is to really um, know that your relationship with somebody can really cross the boundaries or the threshold of the hospital. I think sometimes advocates are very reluctant to step into that and kind of see it as a big bad system, which I'm not saying it isn't. Um, but it's much more friendly and um, really uh, much more approachable when you have somebody either with you or if you wanted to check in with somebody. So they're going to the hospital and you say something like, would it be okay if I call the hospital and let them know or ask for you and see how you're doing? Um, so there's lots of things that we could potentially do to keep that connection and also let the person know, I'm not just sending you into a big bad system or a big system. I am, I'm a caring person who wants to know how you do in that system. And also, you know, let's talk about what can happen um, after you're evaluated. So I just want to, you know, wrap up that, you know, here are some of the things that I see as, um, you know, really key pieces to doing the assessment. Um, and, you know, again, thinking about at the end of this, if you don't come to some agreement with the survivor, um, that there are a few other options that you can exercise. And again, I'd like to stress that I know in my own career this is a the very small percentage of the cases. Most of the time I'm doing safety planning with the person, I'm talking with them, I'm trying to figure out with them what in their life would uh, make it worth living. Um, one of the things I should say that, you know, happens often in these conversations is when I ask somebody, you know, uh, you know, we, we ask people why they want to not live. Um, I also ask people what they like and what would make them want to live. And a lot of times it's, you know, um, a relationship or a cat or um, I, there was a, I always wanted to learn how to do X or Y. And, you know, again, we want to build on that, on their strengths and on their capacity and their desire to live. So that is also part of the conversation, which we didn't really get to talk a lot about today, but I do want to acknowledge before we end. Um, so in that, I'm going to turn it over, I think, to um, Janice. That is the, my portion. Um, there are a few um, related links that I, you know, uh, are at the end of this talk so that you can look at those. And also just realizing that um, one of the things that you should know is just your national and your local helplines for suicide prevention if you're a um, sexual assault provider and also vice versa if you're a, sexual, a, a suicide prevention line, knowing what your rape crisis um, center and what your resources are in that area. So thank you. Lisa, thanks so much. And Elizabeth, thank you as well. Um, that's the end of the slide presentation, so we're going to begin fielding some of the questions that came in through the chat function. And I'll try to um, keep my eyes on that chat function while I'm also listening to the questions. I just wanted to start off to let folks know that this entire presentation, an audio version of this presentation, so pretty much exactly what you heard today will be available to you and you will be, as a participant, you will get a direct link to this particular webinar and that will happen as soon as I figure out how to do that. Now I actually have instructions about that. This is my first time running the webinar and I, the person who usually runs it is, not, is on vacation. So um, I was very glad I didn't cut you all off at any point during this presentation. That was my greatest paranoia. Um, but I have instructions to upload this and you will get a direct uh, link I also wanted to let folks know that this being sponsored by our Suicide Prevention Program, um, 
they sit around the corner from us here at the Department of Public Health. We share space. We're in the same division. Um, and I hardly ever have had the chance to attend their webinars live. But they have everything archived. And I just wanted to throw this out to you because the concept of becoming more comfortable if you are a person who works in sexual assault or domestic violence program, becoming more comfortable with the, the issue of asking questions. I think going through some of the other webinars, the more you get used to it, the more you will know what you know and what you don't know. Um, some of the topics they have are, the titles are That's So Gay, talking about uh, teens and suicide, uh, gay teens and suicide, Standing in the Shadow of Love, the Role of the Black Church in Youth Suicide Prevention, Battle Mind, which is this incredible presentation uh, from a veteran on um, veterans' issues and PTSD. Young Black Men in Suicide, Cyberbullying and Risk of Suicide, Grief After Suicide, Walking the Journey with Survivors, Combating Social Bullying Among Older Adults. Uh, that one I did participate in. That was kind of cool, actually. Uh, grief and Healing After Suicide, Suicide Prevention and Intervention Supporting Transgender Communities, Veterans, Military Personnel, and Suicide Prevention, and a two-part webinar, Youth Suicide and the School Environment. I know there are some educators on this line as well. So I'm just putting in a little plug for the Suicide Prevention free, available to everybody uh, webinars. Um, this will also, there will be a transcribed version of this. That will take a couple of weeks, so it will be accessible to people who are deaf and hard of hearing. There is a um, a, ca a captioning option on the webinar as well. So all of those things will be available. And if you have colleagues who weren't able to attend today that you want to pass the link along to them so that they could go on and do it, yes, thank you. Please do that. All right, so that's, that's our commercial message. Um, you'll also get links to be able to print out all of the slides. I'm not sure. I'll, ask, I'll find out, Lisa, about if we can attach the article or not. I'm not sure what the copyright issue is with that, but yeah. I'll, I'll check into that and find out about that. Um, all right. I wanted to go back to a couple of questions that were asked early on, and uh, I think there's a longer question at the end. And I'll let you know that we actually can go over time on this particular webinar because we added, we bought some extra time. So. You are welcome to discontinue listening at any point in time. And it officially ends at 2.30, but we do have some extra time should there be additional questions. The first question was uh, about, Elizabeth, about your tree activity. Can people get access to that activity and maybe further um, description of how to run that activity? Absolutely. I'd be happy to share that. Uh, when we send the email out, Jen, Janice, I'm happy to share that in a Word document or PDF form. Um, when I utilize the activity, I typically, um, I should go back to the activity real quick. Um, I typically draw the roots out further. The Word document, the text is smaller, so the tree is larger. And what I do is I provide magazines and colorful markers and give them give the survivor, I've done it in group and individually, some time to really um, spend some time doing the activity. I also do it with, I've also done it with um, volunteers and training because I think it's important for them to think about, um, you know, it, I think it builds some empathy. And then when it's done, with the volunteer training, what I do is I fold the tree in half. You don't see the future. And I present the idea that to a survivor, who uh, may be feeling suicidal, that can be what the experience is like. And part of our role is unfolding the tree and helping them gain some perspective. Another tool I'd like to do is to turn the tree sideways once the roots are drawn and expanded and show that the future actually balances our past, that they're equally expansive. We tend to think of our, our roots, our past, as really what anchors us and we're kind of on this borrowed time future thinking. So really to think about the fact that our past is behind us, but our future is equally before us. And I think for a survivor or someone who is suicidal, that's really powerful to see the tree sideways and really emphasize that the trunk the right now is very short and brief in comparison to how we see our past and future, that perspective of the, you know, they really anchor each other. And the right now is this kind of temporary 
um, this temporary state. Um, so I'm happy to share the activity. I encourage you to use it. Feel free to change it to how you see fit. But I, I really encourage you to use it with volunteers, staff, and training, as well as with uh, groups and individuals. I'm happy to share that. Elizabeth, if you email that to me, I'll get that out to folks as well that participated today. And okay. I'll, we'll see if we can try to get it included with um, the webinar broadcast. A couple of people have asked about, so can you give me the, uh, the website and all. Um, I can't get on to the web right now to get that information for you, and I don't want to give it incorrectly. So I definitely will email you, everybody that participated today, with the information about how to access all of those webinars. And we would love to have you spread that information around and go on and take a look at what we have. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, there was another question that came earlier from uh, Wilbur, and it was this. Open-ended questions are important to survivor work when talking to survivors about suicidal ideas. Should there be more emphasis on yes/no questions? So, do you? This is Lisa Hartwick. Do you want me to take that? Sure. So, um, I, can, I think there was also a question similar to that, also, which is, what questions do you ask, and do you want to get to a yes or no? And I know when I was. Um, the cl clinical director at the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center, I had kind of this decision tree, sort of algorithm type thing um, that I think was helpful. And what I thought it was most helpful with, too, is just to um, uh, really do the training and to say to people, you know, uh, suicidal uh, thinking comes up pretty often, particularly on the hotline, uh, you know, or some of the services um, that are particular to rape crisis centers, so some will experience that more. And this kind of gave uh, a way of saying, yeah, you would come down on a yes, no. So, uh, but I think that I didn't include that one because I don't have it anymore, but also I think it depends on what setting you're in. Um, it, I think you do want to come down to a yes or no, but I would also not want people to um, arrive there a little too quickly. Uh, but I do think it's a good idea um, to really work with your, whatever system you're in or to look at different uh, products that might be available um, around safety planning and what is the policies of that particular agency so that if it's um, when somebody says that they're going to hurt themselves and they say yes, um, what does that mean? Does that mean um, you, know, you call an ambulance? Does that mean the supervisor talks to them, does that mean, you know, really what does that mean? So that could be written into, you know, any kind of decision tree type, um, you know, even a one-page thing that you have for your organization. Thank you. If that, if you have other questions from this questions, please feel free to put that in the chat. The next question I wanted to bring up, um, and uh, Casey asked this question. So I'm wondering if you can speak about effective questions volunteers on crisis helplines who are not trained clinicians, and I assume who are also not rape crisis counselors, can ask survivors of sexual assault. For example, how do volunteers navigate through a conversation once a caller or somebody that's chatting, um, I assume emailing or the other methods of communication, once somebody has identified that they're a survivor or victim of sexual assault, so sort of the opposite in training rape crisis folks and DV folks about being comfortable asking the, the questions about, about suicide, the flip side of that, folks who might be very comfortable with the suicide issue may not be comfortable with the issue of sexual assault. And, uh, and I remember this very clearly when I was a rape crisis counselor. Our calls came in through a suicide hotline and actually they were transferred over to us and they literally had a red phone in the room. The rape crisis phone was a red phone and when it rang, they were really happy to transfer those calls over and I felt the same way as a rape crisis counselor. I was really happy to transfer those suicidal folks over to the, the suicide hotline. And, uh, the, but I think that becoming comfortable with both is the goal of this, part of the goal of this webinar. So. Um, Elizabeth, did you want to start off with that, or and, and, and Lisa, please jump in. Yeah, I think that um, my first thought is um, that visual of passing back and forth is something we do a lot, and it still happens. And I think we have to remember that 
these are the same folks. So um, when we put the burden on an individual to kind of cafeteria style seek support, it's not really fair. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't need to work together and learn from each other. But we really have the onus of, of having a skill set of not just saying, oh, you know, I hear suicide, I'm referring you to the Samaritan. You know, I hear sexual assault, I'm referring you. To really try and build our capacities is critical. So I'm glad that question was asked. And I think, you know, really just directly asking, if you have an individual on the phone uh, for, if you're a sexual assault service uh, volunteer, if you're working with a rape crisis center, volunteering for a rape crisis center, to give yourself permission to directly ask, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Make sure you go that next step. Are you having thoughts of ending your life? Um, I think it's important to be direct, to release yourself from some of the fear. Um, and again, to, to say to an individual, I want you to share this with me. I don't want you to hold it alone, but I'm not going to hold it alone either. I have resources I can pull in. I want to be here to help you. Um, and if you're working on a suicide uh, hotline and you get the call and someone um, is feeling is a, a sexual assault survivor to let them know we have services in this state. You are not alone in healing from this. I'm so glad you called tonight. I'm so glad you called today. One of the things I always opened with when, in training and when I was working on hotline is, hi, this is Elizabeth. How can I help you today? Let them tell you how they can help you. If they're asking for help, if they're disclosing suicide, they're looking for your help. So just make sure that you're feeling prepared to offer it with whatever, whatever you have to offer and know that in that instant, you don't have to have all the information to let them know that you're going to engage systems and support to help them. You're going to engage your supervisor. Okay. Lisa, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, no, I think that what Elizabeth said is uh, exactly what I would say. And, you know, um, and also it's okay to say, you know, if you have people who don't know a lot about an area, and I think you mentioned this, Elizabeth, just to say, I really don't know a lot about that, but I can find out and I'm interested in you know, connecting you to what you need. And also, it would be really helpful if people do build their capacity so that, as you said, I couldn't agree more, um, Elizabeth, just so that people don't have to pick, you know, have to call five different lines because they have five different issues, right, that, um, that we build our capacities internally. But I think it's okay, too, sometimes if, if you really don't know something to just kind of be very honest in that moment to say you really don't know, but let's, let's see what we can find out together, and I'm happy to share what you can. So you're kind of um, really embarking on this adventure together. And another thing I would add, and I know that we're at time here, is you know, one thing to think about at the North Shore Rape Crisis Center, something we did under my encouragement was really to think about how do we get someone engaged you know, at this moment. On a hotline, we sometimes think, well, just hotline it, hotline. There's nothing else we can do. Always, you can emphasize this is a confidential hotline. You do not have to share any more information. We do not have to speak again. But if you would like, someone from my agency, if you're a volunteer and it wouldn't be you, can call tomorrow and check in with you. You're welcome to call back. But if you'd like, you can give me information and someone can call you tomorrow or someone you know, can call in the morning, whatever it is, to let them know you're invested, to give that option. Sometimes someone doesn't even have the strength to call in the morning, but knowing that someone's going to call them, that a real person, this is, you know, one of these two people are going to call you in the morning, give them a name, can, can really give a lot of hope. That's an excellent idea. Um, I also, as the uh, contract manager for all the rape crisis programs in Massachusetts, I like to volunteer all of our providers on a pretty regular basis to do lots of things. Um, and all of you who are calling from other states as well, there are rape crisis programs in every state in this country. There are coalitions organized in every state in this country that deal with domestic violence and sexual assault, or there might be separate coalitions for those issues. But going through those folks, I would say that it's a really strong possibility that you can contact your local rape crisis center or your coalition or both and say, I am from the blank, blank organization. I'm from a mental health organization. I'm a teacher. I'm a health care provider. I work on a suicide prevention hotline. Could you come in and talk to us and provide us with some outreach and education and some basic training about what should we do if? And I think that the 
similar to what's called the QPR training in suicide prevention. Oh, sorry about not remembering what the P is. The question, persuade, refer, which is a one-hour training that can be provided to you and your providers and your coworkers about okay, so the base, so I know the basics about suicide prevention. As rape crisis folks, they could provide that same basic. And I think that a piece of it is, first of all, do no harm. And I think that's a great, great fear. It's why healthcare providers don't want to ask about suicide. Healthcare providers don't want to ask about history of violence or sexual assault because I do not know what to do if somebody says yes. If somebody gives an answer, I don't want to say something that could potentially be harmful to them, wrong, not worded correctly, and I think that therefore not asking the question feels easier for me. Um, it is hard to ask the questions and it's hard to engage in the conversations, but I would say reach out to a rape crisis program, befriend them, and provide and share your resources back and forth. Let them know what you do and they can let you know what they do. Um, we can certainly include with the emails for folks the, uh, a couple of national, a, a national number, because I know there are folks from out of state here, but we can, I'll include the list of the rape crisis programs from Massachusetts, because we have a lot of Massachusetts people on this call as well. And I strongly encourage you to get in touch with folks and find out what can they do for you. Um, and then, you know, trade services, what can you do for them? Um, let's see. Oh, here we have Elizabeth. Is uh, I'm going to be posting the Mass Prevent Suicide webinar website. Thank you, Elizabeth, for pulling that out for me. It's kind of a long link, but I will post that. I'm going to send that out to everybody. Um, are there any other questions that people have, or Elizabeth or Lisa? Are there other comments that you have? Um, this is Elizabeth. My um my last comment would be that clearly by the number of people who registered, this is a dialogue that needs to be happening. Um, this is simply a starting point, hopefully beyond 101, the next level. And you know, we really encourage you to have these, uh, have an open dialogue in your organization, um, and uh, and keep the dialogue going. Excellent. I think I'm I'm not seeing any other questions coming up. Any the final comments? Um, I'm, this is Lisa Hartwig. Um, I was going to say one of the things that Elizabeth talked about uh, several times, which I, I think is worth noting and just a good way to end, which is really suicide uh, prevention and talking about it is a practice and that it's something that, you know, pick up uh, where you are in your organization and move forward. It isn't, you know, you don't have to be the experts to start this conversation. And in fact, you know, the more of us who are um, able to uh, feel confident and have some tools to address it, um, the better off everybody will be. Excellent. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that folks who are interested in becoming a trainer on QPR, there is an opportunity to do that in Massachusetts. It's usually a pretty expensive training, but it is being um, offered to Massachusetts folks. In within the next month or so, I think it's going to take place a month and a half, I think. I'm not really sure. So if you um, get in touch with Brandy, and she can explain how to get connected to that. Brandy is uh, the person that emailed you with the information. Brandy works in the Suicide Prevention Program, and we'll get you that information as well. I am really thrilled with the folks who uh, participated in the call today, and I will be wanted to let you know I'll be emailing information to all participants in today's webinar. I'll be posting this webinar as a podcast on our website. In addition, be on the lookout for emails about upcoming webinars and trainings being posted, sponsored by DPH. You'll be added to our, our list of folks that receive that information. And I wanted to let you know after you log off, please take a few minutes to complete the evaluation that will magically appear on your screen. It's a very brief survey monkey, um, and I'd, we would really appreciate the feedback. I hope you've gained some knowledge today about the experience and needs of survivors of sexual assault that may exhibit suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And I thank you all for participating and, and enjoy the rest of your day um, and, and be safe. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Please stand by.